So we'll turn in your hymn books to number 614. sermon this morning. Uh, it's good to see you here, Sister Cheryl. Uh, right. Uh, Cheryl and I go back a long way. I won't say how far. But uh, in a little place called Blair's Mill is where I first met her. Her mom and dad and all of the family. And I've got good memories of that place and those people. Uh, also, it's good to see Chris and Paul home. And uh, Chris and I talked a little bit about junior pro. Uh, that has to stand out that year. And all the year of the athletics, we didn't win a game. But we kept getting better, didn't we, Chris? And we peaked the right time and just took the tournament. I don't think anybody was expecting that. Uh, I thought we could if we kept working at it. And having said that, we need to keep working at being faithful to our master. <clears throat> We're living in a time when there's so many things to pull us away. And some of them sound good, but basically, they'll take us in the wrong direction. And uh, to live life and, and be with people and be associated with people and, and have good memories. I, I'm starting to uh, let that reinforce me more and more as I go by. Uh, we're going to talk for just a few minutes. I want you to go, if you will, to the book of Matthew, the sixth chapter. I got one verse. Nobody likes conditioning. Nobody likes fundamentals. I found that true in every aspect that you go into. If you if you go into the job market, you go into athletics, you go into any anything. We have trouble with mastering the fundamentals, and yet we expect the rewards that are coming down. And so, mastery of little things, I have found, means more than the big things in life. The big things in life will come at you, the little things you live with every day. Out of all of knowing the Bible, studying the Bible, being a student of the Bible and where we should. We look at mastering things, and I want you to look at number 11 in the sixth chapter of the book of Matthew. <coughs> These are the words of Jesus. He practiced it. And we need to possess it. It's, it's not hard to understand, but it's difficult to do. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. For this is the law of the prophets. He said everything is wrapped up into our actions in man's reaction to man or woman to woman. The creation, how we react to things around us and, and people around us. There's feedback. For every action, there's a reaction. You can't stop that. That's fundly, uh, fundamentally built into the physics of this world that God made. You throw something up, it's going to come down. You throw an action out, there's always a reaction. And that's what he was saying. Just treat people the way you'd want them to treat you. I don't think that's hard to understand. 
It's just maybe that we, in our Christian experience, we haven't dwelt on it. We, maybe we have moved on to something else, and we haven't dwelt on that one simple thing that is able to turn our life around from the standpoint of happiness, from the standpoint of self-satisfaction, from the standpoint of our relationship with our fellow man on a daily basis. We're blessed to have this house that we can come to and we can share experiences and, and we can share in the hurts and we can share in the joys and we can share in all these things. We are very, very blessed. The best way that I know uh, to handle this situation is let's uh, go to the Bible. Just bear with me because sometimes... Uh, I have trouble seeing. I think the 16th verse of the 12th chapter. 16th verse of the 12th chapter. Again, this is a parable and Jesus taught in parables. He made people think. A parable makes you think. What's really in there? What is he saying? What does it mean? How do you apply it? Then he spake a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully, and he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? That's a legitimate question. Harvest had come. He had more than his barn would hold. Now what does he do? What's his attitude? Let's look at his attitude, and then we'll go back and look if he'd have had a different mindset. So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all of my crops and my goods, and I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Now that's an attitude. And here was the result. But God said to him, Fool, thou fool. Which means he didn't handle it right. He was foolish. He could have done something else. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? You're gone. Everything that you've labored for and your barns were full and all of this was full and we've taken the attitude, kick back, enjoy life. That's an attitude. And for every attitude, there's a reaction. And God said, you missed the mark, brother. You're, you're checking out tonight. And then he said, who is going to inherit what you left? There was nothing wrong with him having all this. You hear preachers say today, oh now, you can't have. I'm going to say that if you didn't have the rich in this country today, you would not have a job, you would not have the economy you've got, and you would not have some of the offshoots of the things that they provide. Get off of that kick. Don't ever get on it. Because the reaction to that, do you know what it is? to run a business. If you've not, how can you condemn a business? That people tie themselves to that job on a daily basis. The success or failure of that business rides upon their decision and their efforts. Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And He said, I'll add all of these other things to you. And I don't know of anybody sitting in this house that doesn't have clothes to wear, a home to live in, a good car to drive, meals to eat. Because you've done something about it. You made an effort. And your reaction toward that was good. 
His reaction was, I'm just going to increase. I'm going to build. I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. And then God, in short, said, you made the wrong choice. And tonight, you're going to the house. Your life is over. You have messed it up. And then he said, who's will inherit what you have? Now, what would have been the proper attitude? And, and you've already got this read out. You know what it's going to be. <coughs> He could have looked around at his neighbor farmer and said, look, that guy's crops are not doing so good. I'm going to share with him. Would that have been a good attitude? Yeah. Or this family over here has got some kids and they're not doing well and, and they're struggling. And so I'll take some of my goods to them. If that had been the attitude, there's a piece of scripture that comes to my mind. In doing that, he would have become a servant of God because he was serving God. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many. Enter thou into the joys of the Lord. But he failed to become a servant. And therefore, he was condemned by his own actions, not someone else's. If we stand in the presence of God, God is not going to ask us why we didn't do something. Because you know what the results would have been. Well, now my neighbor down there, he went to church every Sunday and he's worse than I am. Get out of here. Quit passing the buck to somebody else and say, I am a sinner in the sight of God. I stand in need of eternal life. But instead we say, somebody else caused me to do that. That's a reaction too. But it's not a good one. Another illustration I want to use in the Bible. <coughs> is found in the book of Luke. Again, the 16th chapter. I want to start with the 19th verse. So that we don't take the wrong attitude about having things. We need to have things. If you don't, somebody's going to have to take care of you. If I don't take care of me, somebody's going to have to. And I stress to people, take care of yourself. And then once you've done that, you'll be able to help someone else. And there is a passage of Scripture in Luke 16. And I want to start with the 19th verse. Now there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. I mean, that old boy flat had it made. He didn't need a thing. Sumptuously means just out of this world. I mean, that, that's sumptuous. Did you read anything or hear anything there that said that was wrong? If not, why do we get the idea that that was wrong? See, we form ideas about things that aren't right. That aren't even scriptural. We form opinions about it and they start to direct our life and our course. And so we're looking for an action. This was his action. He was doing good. He had plenty. Heard sumptuously every day. Now in verse 20, it's where the decision making comes. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus full of sores who was laid at his gate. And I don't know what happened there. 
If he didn't have the means to take care of himself, if he had no family, I know nothing about that situation except the Bible said that he was a beggar. He wasn't healthy, it tells you that there. Maybe he wasn't able to work. And there are people who aren't able to work. And so as we set the situation, and here is, to me, the clincher. He said, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. And he said, more over the dogs came and licked his sores. Brother, that is getting pretty low when animals have more love and affection for you and your situation than your next door neighbor That's the situation. How would we have handled it? Let's go to the flip side. What would have been the scriptural way? But let me finish that, he said. All he said, I, you know, I don't want a feast. I just want some crumbs. That's all I want. So it was that the beggar died. And if you don't believe that's going to happen to you this morning, we've got a problem and once you die if you fall in sin you will be raised in sin and will be in the condemnation in the judgment day of God no excuses if we're living in sin today we have never been born again of the water and the spirit as they were on the day of Pentecost if we have never done that and we leave this life I'm going to put it bluntly. You've had the lick. That's it. Plain and simple. There's no change after we fall. And so it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. Evidently, he had done something right. Perhaps he had lived godly and had a love for God and maybe even had a love for his fellow man. He just couldn't take care of himself. And he said, oh, I want a few crumbs. The Bible said that there are times when we have entertained angels unaware. You say, preacher, I don't believe in that. That's fine. You go ahead. I'm going to go with what the book says. Has there been people that crossed your path that you didn't know and had a legitimate need and we didn't do it? I can't speak for anybody but myself and yes, yes. There have been times in my life when I was too busy too busy and I let it slip by me evidently he had done something right or the angels of God would not have taken him the rich man also died and was buried happens to everybody happens to everything. Do you know that everything that is created and made has to be fed and after a period of time it dies. Trees die. Animals die. People die. And once we realize that it can happen to us, life takes on a different meaning what it did for me. It took on a different meaning. There was a time in my life when I didn't want to lay down and go to sleep because I thought I might not wake up. That's a horrible condition to be in. We 
could go when we're ready. If we've done what the Master said and are living the way the Master said to live, there ain't no doubt in my mind. I don't have any doubts this morning whatsoever. But it happened. And being in torments in Hades or hell, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. This is a parable, or so it's not been said. They use proper names here, Lazarus. That's what everybody, everybody forms their opinion about it, whether it is or whether it isn't. But look at the end result of that parable. And then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this frame. Do you see how it flipped around? He didn't have time to give the bag of the crumbs that fell from his table, but now he is looking and said, send Lazarus and just do a simple thing. Give me a drop of water on my tongue. You see, it had flipped around. The situation has now changed. And we see the results of that situation. And Abraham said, Son, and I sink this home to myself that will be your decision how you want to deal with it but Abraham said son remember that in your lifetime you receive your good things and likewise Lazarus evil things remember have memory will you have memory <laughs> absolutely But now he is comforted and you are tormented. That situation could never have happened if that rich man had have taken care of the beggar. But he didn't and he found himself in that position. 12 o'clock. I'm going to cut it short there. Uh, and Lord willing, we're going to have church tonight at 7 o'clock. If you can make it fine, if you can't. But I want to finish that up. Because I think that is one of the most important things that we can center our mind in. Listen, we live good. We live good. We ought to be conscious of other people that didn't. And this church, I want to say this, this church does a marvelous job with the money you put in the offering to take care of people that are in need. I hope you can come back to, tonight and uh, we'll finish up, Lord willing, on actions, reactions, and then let's look at the results. It's been good to be with everybody again. And I want to thank you for being here. We're going to stand and sing an invitation song. If you're here and God has spoke to you through this message and you ain't got your house in order, brother, your sister, you better dwell on it now. If you've fallen from grace, if you have lost the joy of being a Christian, all you've got to do right there with a repentant heart and say, God, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. If I'm going to be unhappy, it's not going to be in the Christian experience. If I'm going to be unhappy, I'm going to be like the rest of the world. I'm in turmoil. I have doubts. I have confusion. I have all of those things. And yet to the Christian, in the stillness of this day, 
we can make ourselves better people by listening to the voice of God. David, oh my, what that man went through. And after he went through all of the agony, all of the pain, all of the suffering, all of the greatness, all of the down settings, and he lost everything down to his little boy. The result of that situation was they did come to this conclusion. I can't bring him back, but I can go to him. That should be our attitude today. God has been good to you. If you're living in sin today, you've never committed your life to Christ. God has been good to you. He's blessed you with a good mate, with children, a good job, all of the things that go with it. And yet, the reaction is, I really don't need him. You need to make that decision. And if you're here today as a Christian, you need to be happy even with all the, the trials and the tribulations and whatever comes at us, we need to be happy. If you will, uh, turn to number 614. Number 